Riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense All the songs are b-sides and the cover art's a mess There's so much here to tear apart Listen to it for a week Now that we has passed Why I hate this album Podcast with Tim and Garrett Hello and welcome to another episode of Why I Hate This Album I am Garrett Harvey With me as always, Bill to my Ted Co-host to the stars, Timothy Richardson Tim, how are you? Upbeat A little uncomfortable, but pretty upbeat Why don't you tell the folks at home, in case they didn't read the title of the podcast they downloaded, what are we talking about today? This week, we are talking about Britney Spears' In The Zone, released November 12th, 2003. Get out your baby tees and your tight jeans. We're talking Britney. Tim, we're not going to make the same mistake we made last week. Let's get it right out front. Do you hate this album? I don't think so, but maybe... Okay. It's so far away from any music that was ever intended for me that I find it hard to say I actually hate it. I would never listen to this voluntarily, and I didn't much care for this week, to be honest. What about you? Well, sad to say I'm kind of in the same camp. It's unfair to say I hate this album. I don't like it, and I really, really didn't enjoy listening to it. And I may be convinced to hate it by you or by myself, but I can't say right now that I hate it. All right, so we're going to try and get each other there this week. Simultaneously, uh, you're getting me there while I'm getting you there. I'm in. uh, That's not what I said at all. That's what you said. I don't have the energy to fight you. (laughs) God, this this is how it starts. Is this the first time your Britney has been speared? No, I don't have much experience with her in general. She rose to fame while I was in high school. You were in your early 30s working in a steel mill. I um, but <laughs> I don't know why you insist on insinuating that I am so much older than you. I don't know why you insist on lying to our audience. The point is, I remember all the girls at my high school just being fucking obsessed with this. And at the time, I found it very annoying. This is what girls at that age were listening to while guys listened to new metal at my high school. This is nuisance pop. On this album, I think I had heard Toxic, but that might be it. What about you? As you mentioned, I am slightly older than you, so I was in college when this came out, I think. So it was less prevalent. I definitely had not heard the album. I had seen the music video to Toxic because I would sporadically still watch MTV when this came out. I can't say that I knew any of the other songs, and I can't say that I know them now. They do not stand out for me. This album actually came out my freshman year in college, but her rise to fame or whatever happened. Oh, well, if we're talking rise to fame, then I do have a couple of personal touch points. Steel Um, mill. Dancing in those steel mill breaks. I got it. No. You work hard and you play hard. The Rolling Stone cover that featured Miss Britney Spears in an open shirt in Brazier was helpful to me in high school. I had a Rolling Stone subscription and I held on to that issue for a bit. Yeah, I guess just the one touch point, but it was a lot of touching at that point. So (laughs) it's significant. You gross, sticky little boy. (laughs) Accurate. Before we dig into this week's album, we like to take a moment to help our listeners understand who this artist is and how they rose to prominence, the bedrock on which this album was created. So Tim, take us on a journey back through time, through the rise of Miss Britney Spears. Britney Jean Spears was born in 1981 in Mississippi, but she was raised for a good portion of her early life in a very small town, about 2,000 people, on the Louisiana-Mississippi border. As a child, she either was into or was forced into super Southern Baptist Christianity. She sung in the church choir. She also started dance lessons at age three, which, as far as I'm concerned, seems to be her one true interest throughout all of this. This girl likes to dance. There's no denying that. When she was eight, her mom, who... Her mom's a monster, right? Possibly both her parents. Her mom took her to Atlanta to audition for the Mickey Mouse Club. This is 1989 or 1990. And this, in my mind, just forever ruins her life. This is the point at which she was going to have a bad life. She was initially rejected because she was too young, but they apparently saw promise, which I find creepy. Um, Mm -hmm. And they sent her to a talent agent 
and then she was enrolled in a performing arts high school in Hell's Kitchen, New York City, which seems like a nice thing to do for your daughter. It's a really nice thing to do if she's chasing her dream. But if she's eight, she has no dreams, except for possibly about ponies and rainbows. So this is definitely the act of somebody who wants to live off of the fruits of their children. She was an understudy for this off-Broadway musical. She auditioned on Star Search, and she was in a few commercials. But finally, in 1992, her mom's lifelong dream was realized. Brittany was cast in the Mickey Mouse Club alongside Christina Aguilera, Justin Timberlake, the ever-dreamy Ryan Gosling, and Carrie Russell, who you probably know best as Felicity from TV's Felicity. That is how I know her. And turns out I have two touch points. The one I mentioned earlier about the touching. The other is this is my Mickey Mouse Club. There... (sighs) Okay. (laughs) What? We had the Disney Channel. Uh It wasn't the Disney Channel you have today. There were no commercials. It was no original programming except for the Mickey Mouse Club and Kids Incorporated. I don't want to know any more about this Mickey Mouse experience you had. Fine. You're missing out. The Mickey Mouse Club gets canceled in 1996, apparently crushing a 26-year-old Garrett Harvey's heart. And she moves back to Macomb, Mississippi, where she hates everything and everyone for not being famous. That sounds right. It seems like a terrible move. Yeah. In 1997, Lou Pearlman, who is the famed Backstreet Boys in sync mastermind. I was going to say famed scumbag manager, Lou Pearlman. Sure. He's also a Ponzi schemer, and uh, he's a felon who would die in prison two decades later. He put together an all girl boy band called Innocence, and Miss Spears was a founding member, although she would leave the same year. And a lot of people would call that a girl group. But you have to remember we're talking about Lou Pearlman, that man does not know girl groups. He knows nope. boys and he knows boy bands. Boy howdy. He knows his boys. Yeah, yeah this is a girl boy band. Girl <laughs> boy band. <laughs> yeah. So after she leaves Innocence, family friend and entertainment lawyer Larry Rudolph got her to record some solo demos before Jive Records scoops her up, and they commission her first album, and they send her to Sweden to record it for some reason. After she records the album, she comes back to the U.S. and goes on a shopping mall tour in 1998. Again, this is whenever she's supposed to be in high school, right? Isn't there a government agency? Where's Betsy DeVos, man? (laughs) Well, she's not looking out for anybody, but a shopping mall tour has got to sound weird to some of our younger listeners. Yeah, it sounded weird to me at first. She goes on the shopping mall tour with a couple of backup dancers and four songs, but all of a sudden, a lot of sound... South Park and American Dad jokes make a lot more sense to me. Yeah, I would imagine you had no real cultural touchstone for that. I saw a couple of bands in some shopping mall tours. I saw <laughs> Tiffany. I saw New Kids on the Block. You saw Marky Mark? No, Was Marky he... Mark's not New Kids on the Block, you asshole. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what New Kids on the Block His brother is. Donnie is. Oh, that's right. The one that didn't assault Asian men because they were Asian. True. Allegedly. Allegedly. Marky Mark definitely did that. Allegedly refers to the fact that Donnie may not have. He probably did. Right. I've heard that they are a couple of tough customers. A shopping mall tour is what record companies used to do to basically introduce or focus group. That's how they would focus group their new acts. I don't know what they do now. I guess it's all YouTube because nobody goes to the fucking mall. Why would you? Just order it. She then goes on tour as the opening act for NSYNC, and her first album, Baby One More Time, is released in 1999, and it immediately debuts at number one, Garrett. It goes double platinum in the U.S. in a month, and it sells 10 million copies worldwide in the first year. Now, she's 17. Yeah, nothing bad's going to come of that. Right. This is another point where we can all stop and say, uh, this is going to end tragically. In fact, honestly... It didn't end nearly as tragically as it probably should have. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I can so, only assume her mother took the majority of that money so that she would stay grounded. You're absolutely right, though. It doesn't end nearly as poorly as it could have because she has no education. She doesn't get to have a childhood. This easily could have ended with her trying to lure Macaulay Culkin into her backyard amusement park with the promise of getting to play with some sort of monkey named Bubbles. That's how this is going at this point. As a hypothetical, but just a for instance. 
the whole Baby One More Time tour was plagued by people that were just outraged with her outfits. I did think it was weird, though, at 17, it was her idea to do the whole Catholic schoolgirl look for the music video to Hit Me Baby One More Time. Oh, it was. they wanted it to be animated. And she was like, no, no, no. Let's make it, like, real sexy. I assume it was her parents' idea. They're horrible, horrible people. In 2000, Oops, I Did It Again is released, and that album would go on to sell 20 million copies. She goes on tour for that, co-writes a book with her mom, and uh, begins dating Justin Timberlake. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, unless you're Justin Timberlake. Timberlake. I meant for her. (laughs) Do you see that guy's curls, man? Good God. Anyway, 2001. Hold on. (laughs) I don't even know where to start here. I don't even know if I should. No, probably not. Let's move on. Let's keep it moving, Garrett. It's important to note that as she begins dating Justin Timberlake, she also makes the public declaration that she is saving herself for marriage. Now, you wouldn't think that that has anything to do with the album we're discussing today, but it's so incredibly important. (laughs) In 2001, her third album comes out. That sells 12 million copies, and it's considered slightly more adult. She publishes a second book with her mom and becomes a Pepsi spokesman, spokesperson, excuse me, Sorry, Leans. Before she is 20, she has just all the money in the world. PETA gets mad at her. She does a VMA and there's a caged tiger and she's got a python and so they don't like her. I don't know. She tours for the third album in 2002 and stars in the terrible but financially successful movie Crossroads. Breaks up with Justin Timberlake. And then the two make a couple of songs and music videos kind of at each other. Yeah. And then Fred Durst claims to have had his gross, dirsty way with her, which obviously this is untrue because as established and revealed on this very show, Fred Durst was almost certainly still a virgin at this point. Yeah, he was very much a stranger in the ways of a woman. What's interesting, though, is that it does coincide with the breakup of Justin Timberlake and a serious change in tone. I mentioned how she was allegedly celibate. And, you know, that's a hard pill to swallow. I have a difficult time believing that. However, as we'll get into a little bit later, there's a very good chance that she stuck to that pledge. (laughs) (laughs) Until shortly after breaking up, or shortly before breaking up with Justin Timberlake. Allegedly before, and I'm very sad that I know any of this. I don't care, but you're right, it is very relevant to this album. In 2003, she does the VMAs with Christina Aguilera and Madonna. They perform Like a Virgin. She kisses Madonna, which again causes controversy. And then... It's mostly just gross, by the way. Madonna is... She's a skeleton. A horrible, horrible skeleton. (laughs) You summed it up beautifully. Continue. (laughs) And then this album is released in November of 2003. This is her fourth album. She is 21 at this point. And that brings us up to date, but we do need to go a little bit further and discuss a few other events after this album to kind of give some context for what all of this history has done to her. Honestly, it's not her fault. She had every right to to go a little crazy. A bunch of shitty people, including her parents, mostly her parents, had just been taking advantage of her financially since she was 12 or possibly three because she's the financial lifeline for basically everyone that knows her. The amount of work that she must have had to do to create this much output in such a short period of time, despite her music and the, her, the sound of her, she is one hard working person. I respect the shit out of that. I and mean, I hate to say that. Yeah, she's a real Toby Keith. Toby Keith is the Walmart of music. <laughs> it's not for us. But she at least pulls together, well, I don't know if she does, but she has a team that pulls together people that make the best version of this shit. Absolutely. After this album, 2004, she gets married to Jason Alexander in Las Vegas for a full 55 hours. Then that gets annulled. And I know it's not the Jason Alexander we all know and love, but (laughs) I I have to pretend that it is. And good for Jason Alexander. She gets tricked into getting into Kabbalah by Madonna, gets married to Kevin Federline, or K-Fed, as you insist on calling him, but I suspect that's just an attempt to get the nickname G-Harv, and I'm not fucking falling for it. She stars in a reality show with K-Fed, and she starts Curious Perfume. Are we 100% now in our female artists that we have discussed on the show having perfume every one of them 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think the podcast needs to release a scent. God, Garrett, I have, I mean, I'm smelling you now, but I have smelled you at your best and worst, and they're the same. <laughs> yeah, it's a slim margin. It's a musk, Tim. It is musky. I like that. to consider it leather and sandalwood. It's not. It is no. um, Austin filth. There's a lot of that. There's a weird amount of peanut butter, which is, I know you don't eat peanut butter. No, nope, don't get near the stuff. Well, you do get near it because you reek of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, my pockets are filled with peanuts. <laughs> But that's in case I ever run into an elephant. Yeah, occasionally I eat some of your pocket peanuts. They are moist. Anyway, 2005 to 2006, she has two kids, quits Kabbalah, uh, and gets divorced. Then she does the public head shaving thing, loses custody of her kids, gets sued by Louis Vuitton, releases a fifth album, Blackout, starts dating one of the paparazzi that follow her around everywhere. I mean, there's an outlier there. She released a fucking album in the middle of this. Yeah, she made a wildly successful album in the middle of an emotional and mental breakdown. Like I said, she's a hard worker. Yeah. I just want to point out how fucked up she had to have been to lose custody of her children to Kevin Federline. 2008, she refuses to give Kev custody of her children, their children. She is hospitalized against her will. Then she is remanded to a psych facility in Los Angeles on a 5150 psych hold. And then she loses custody of herself to an attorney and to Jamie Spears, presumably her father, possibly her sister. That is confusing. Also in 2008, her album Circus is released and she becomes the first female artist to have five number one albums. Where does she find the time? It makes me question how much input she has. I it's... would argue that the album we're doing today is the closest to an accurate reflection of her music. Of like what I she believes. She, yeah, I think she had maximum input on this album. She mostly pulls herself together and good for her. She never regains custody of herself, though. She is still in some sort of weird conservatorship with her father or is sister, she really? possibly. She does not get to choose what she does with her money. She keeps putting out albums every couple of years, and she recently did one of those Las Vegas residencies. She currently holds the record for high grossing single show and she still earns between 30 to 40 million dollars per year all of which her dad or possibly sister is in control of general thoughts okay as we both said it's not for us no it is a dance album right most of the music and words seem to be encouraging me to dance or have sex mm, yes or dance or, in an effort to get someone to have sex with me i don't i don't understand what the message on most of this is i think it's some sort of sex dancing Ooh, i can Not get behind be confused that. with dirty dancing or dance sexing yeah it might be dance sexing the point is that people are being penetrated during the dance <laughs> jesus christ this is not my album. Don't fucking judge me. I didn't do anything. I'm reading lyrics here. I think this is an album by somebody who desperately wants to not have to sit at the kids' table this Thanksgiving. Right. It's somebody that at 21 had their first sexual experience and was like, you know what? I am an adult now, as of yesterday. And I'm going to And everybody let the needs world to learn that sex is okay and it's awesome. Everyone should be doing this. I just... Have y'all heard about sex? <laughs> yep, heard we have. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> You've done your version of it to her. Okay, that's... Don't be crass. 61 people slash groups slash production teams were involved in making this album. Sounds light, honestly. That does include fan favorites Moby, R. Kelly, and Wizards of Oz. There is a healthy amount of musical plagiarism going on in this album. I would like to know what percentage of this is samples, what percentage of this is stolen, and what percentage of this is new, I guess. Do you think that we did a disservice to ourselves by listening to this album instead of somehow watching it? Well, once again, this is like the third or fourth time we found an album that relies heavily on a major production for you to appreciate it. Yeah, we're listening to a album and we're participating in the wrong medium somehow. Let's pretend instead of the first time you saw Caddyshack, you just heard Caddyshack. I'm laughing already. That gopher isn't nearly hilarious if you never see him. I don't know how many gophers are in this album. Six. 
No, you're guessing. In that context, this seems like music for people that don't really like music. And I think that's sort of what pop should be. It's meant for people that are never gonna really listen to music. They want it on for background noise. Or they just want to dance to it. And if I knew how to dance, and I had someone to dance with... You do, friend. At any time you want. I never, ever, ever want to dance with you. We're going to ACL fairly soon. Yes, we are. We're going to dance together. I will not dance with you. Yeah, you will. There's Middle Eastern and then this Bangra music, specifically in the song Toxic, but it pops up a lot of other places. It meshes better than it should. Yeah, that's not my biggest problem with this album by any means. She also has writing credits on two-thirds of these songs. What that translates to, I think, is that songs were brought to her and then she kind of tweaked them to make them more personal, I guess. And by that, I mean horny. Very, right. very I, The part horny. where you're talking about dancing, could I just, could we make that more about sex? I just recently had it and it is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Is she a good singer? The vast majority of the vocals on this, it's whispered, it's spoken. There's a lot of spoken word on this. This is a real fucking boarding house reach of an album. Or they're auto-tuned to shit. And many times the spoken word portions are also (laughs) auto-tuned. This is the first time I've ever seen this credit, and I'm quoting here, vocal editing. Hmm. Yeah, you need the entire Disney Imagineer team to make her voice sound the way it does on this album. Because it doesn't sound like a person. It sounds like some sort of robot baby girl lady. Yes. (laughs) Baby doll is probably the, the right term. Some sort of robot baby doll. It's super creepy. Her whole aesthetic could be summed up by a saying that's sort of person who calls their boyfriend daddy. Oh yeah, she's a big fan of daddy. Let's move into the song by song. Track number one. Me against the music. Me against the music. Uh-huh. It's just me and me. Yeah. Opens a little like uh, Lady Gaga, in my opinion. I think we're starting off with filler. I mean, obviously it's featuring Madonna, so they don't think so. And also it was the first single, so clearly they don't think so. But this, this is not good. Oh no, no, it's not good. However, I would make the argument that the first half of the album is considerably better than the second half. There's almost ballads on the second half. Um, We need to get into the Madonna of all this. There's a lot of things in here about Madonna that I don't like. Now, let me just say, Tim, in the 80s and early 90s as a young boy... Oh, God. I enjoyed Madonna songs. Yeah, I, this is going to be another uh, magazine cover situation. No, 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 no. I was a very young man. It was not on my mind. I just legitimately really liked Madonna music. I mean, it was the popular music at the time, so whatever. I was very young. My point being is that she has no business here anymore. I assume you heard about how this came together, right? These yeah, two were yeah. never in the same room recording this. Britney Spears records the song then sends the song to Madonna, who then privately on her own determines where she will begin singing and what she will then say and add to the song and sends it back. This is a real Blake Shelton, Gwen Stefani situation. Didn't they do that? Yes, they did. More or less. The difference here is that I get the distinct impression that... Now, there's only two people in the song. But Madonna, to me, seems like some sort of weird third wheel. Or possibly uh, like a twin (laughs) situation where she's the Danny DeVito character. It opens with Britney Spears singing, It's me against the music, just me. Okay, no Mm -hmm. problem with that line whatsoever. Then you hear Madonna pipe in, and me. It's almost as if Britney Spears was not aware that she was going to be doing this, and they're just like, this will be fun. I'm sure she won't mind. We'll just stick Madonna on here. Did you happen to catch the music video for this song? No, I didn't. Okay, well, don't. It is Britney Spears in a cat and mouse game chasing down, which this part makes no sense, chasing down Madonna as the woman of her dreams, and the music video ends with Madonna fading away just as they're about to kiss. As you mentioned, Madonna's a weird bony skeleton lady. And now, 45 is not that old. Not at all. But she is 45 when they make this music video. And Britney Spears is like 21. One, we're supposed to believe that Britney Spears is in any way sexually attracted to Madonna. Hey, she might be. She does not know what she likes yet. Yeah, that's true. At this point, she was still pure at heart. 
my point here is that if this exact same scenario existed with a man, so Madonna's 45, if you replace Madonna in this music video being alluring and Britney Spears chasing her all over the music uh, nightclub there with, say, Vincent D'Onofrio, who's <laughs> an entire year younger than Madonna, or perhaps Gary Oldman or Kevin Bacon or Drew Carey. <laughs> No one would be buying it. I would love to see her going after Drew Carey. My point is, those are all the same age as Madonna in this. It's not sexy. It's just sad. You're a grandmother. Well, but see, that's the thing. A woman can't be sexy whenever they're old. And that's really a societal thing, Garrett. No, no, for no. Example, for are, example, you... a Drew Carey, that guy's still sexy. And he's, <laughs> like you said. <laughs> See, I'm I just don't understand why you always tape the prices right. He's on the oh, prices right. He's the host, you asshole. Really? Yeah, Bob Barker retired years ago. So she's fighting music in this song? That is also confusing. I assume it's not how you fight music. No, no. There is less swinging at the air. Less smashing of iPhones. That was out of fear and rage in the moment. This is a concentrated effort to fight against music. She explained this song as about just going to a club and letting yourself go and battling with whoever is around you and battling against the music as well. I'm glad you brought this up. (laughs) You confirmed a theory I had. I was going to ask you this question, but Brittany answered it for me. Is this the theme for a dance battle? So you got some lyrics here. If you really want to battle, saddle up and get your rhythm. Trying to hit a chick ta Don't know what that is. In a minute, I'm going to take you on. I'm going to take you on. She's preparing to serve someone or potentially at least initiate the battle, signifying that it is on. But also she is planning on serving the music itself. That's how good at dancing she is. Did you hear the duck in this song? (laughs) I did not hear a duck in this song. You got to listen closely, but towards the latter third of the song, you just start hearing whack. (laughs) I don't think that's in there. I think you have a tumor, possibly? No, listeners of the show, tell Tim I'm right. There is a duck in this song. There's a duck. Fuck you. There's a duck. Track number two, I Got That Boom Boom, featuring the Yin Yang Twins. (laughs) Garrett, I do not like the Yin Yang Twins. I've read several places that describe this as Atlanta-style hip-hop. I do not like Atlanta-style (laughs) hip-hop. I don't like people shouting shorty on my songs. And point number four, it's Yin Yang, right? These are a different kind of twins, Tim. I assume you weren't familiar with the Yin Yang Twins. They had a very popular song. I can't say the year. Let's call it 2005. It was called The Whisper Song. Oh, I and like it. Fucked me. I hate you so much. <laughs> in case you're new to the show, that is from the corn episode. In which... That's from the Limp Biscuit episode. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, featuring corn. <laughs> and Tim has held on to that since that early episode, and he likes to whisper it at me, and I like to try my best to ignore it. So I selected the least offensive lines from this famous Ying Yang twin song. And I'm going to read them to you just to give you a sense for who these fellas are. You got a sexy ass body and your ass looks soft. Mind if I touch it and see if it's soft? No, nah, I'm just playing. <laughs> Let's just say that I can. And I known to be a real nasty man. That's delightful. Those, just those were the least <laughs> gross words in that song. This to me, it may as well be like the whoop, there it is, or who let the dogs out for stretches. It's Well, uh, there's a reason that you're thinking about that era of music. They are full on ripping off a song called Boom 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 from 1995 by a band called the Out Here Brothers. Hmm. And it goes boom, boom, boom. Let me hear you say whale. Oh, whale. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there you go. Mm-hmm. I didn't know I cared so much about the Out Here Brothers. <laughs> but when I heard this song, I was like, how dare you, Ying Yang twins? So the words boom boom is obviously in reference to both the bass in the club and sex. Oh, I assumed it was her ass. Maybe. I wish it had more Britney Spears in it. Yes, absolutely. Because the Ying Yang twins are fucking terrible. The goddamn bridge on this song, Twilly Twilly What, Twilly Twilly What... Twilly Twilly Shorty, get on the dance floor, shake that ass for me. Twilly Twilly, Twilly Twilly, Twilly Twilly. 
Rock solid. Some other lyrics from this. Is she naked? You know what? I'm not going to read these. (laughs) They're terrible. I'm seriously wondering if the boom boom is a reference to intercourse, dancing, or as I thought, her butt. Well, it is in some places a reference to her butt. That is absolutely true. I got that boom boom you want. Watching me all night long. Hurry up before it's gone. I got that boom boom you want. I don't think you should wait. One minute might be too late. I don't think we've said this on a track by a female musician before i don't think lena dunham approves of this boy you think it's too overtly sexualized even for lean i think that britney spears is sexualizing herself in a way that leans pure feminism would just not tolerate okay i see so the way she's presenting herself is is almost a detriment to womanhood in general Well, I mean, absolutely that's the case. I just think she is uh, promoting objectification, self-objectification even, in a way that uh, Miss Dunham would object to. Boy, this is a sticky wicket, Tim, because I know that Leans would appreciate somebody owning their body and being proud of the way they look. But you're right, this is... But what if that person was talked into this song by their father? Slash owner now. Boy, he does kind of own her, doesn't he? That's right. And also a lawyer somewhere. Or possibly her sister. Wow, we just found a loophole here. (laughs) You can own people. (laughs) Jesus Christ. We did. But technically, we just own all of their assets. But here's the issue. I know who you're thinking of. If you own all of Brad's assets, that's just... All he has is debt. I was going to say, only stuff he has is stuff we've given him that he he broke, so... Yeah, he went to Columbia. I don't know how he got into Columbia, but majored in liberal arts and then decided to become a recording engineer and decided to try and work his way up in our organization, and that's not going well for him. No, I would say, if anything, he is only moving in a downward trajectory. Yeah, you cannot pay your student loans off in pastries. By the way, if you go to a donut shop, they put all of the unused donuts in a big plastic bag behind the shop. Ooh, I've just been paying them in day-old stale donuts. I don't know how to make beignets. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what you are making. I would not call them beignets. All right, let's move on. Song three, Showdown. Love for you, though. Did you check out my video? Who let Trent Reznor in? Oh, I don't know, but this is very empowering. (laughs) Is it? This is what empowering looks like. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, you have been powering wrong. This is, I guess, where we begin a lot of the spoken word. We're done singing. And I was not expecting that. Did you notice the Jack White Yaz? That I did notice. That's all I can hear now. Anytime (laughs) I hear somebody randomly just shout, Yeah! (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's Jack White. <laughs> oh, that shouldn't be a thing. This is a better song than two thirds of that album. Yeah, and that is blasphemy. Yeah, because this is a garbage song. It's empowering. It you still don't have me sold on how this is possibly empowering. I'll build my case. I think this whole album is very empowering. She makes the argument that a fulfilling relationship is built on the bedrock of picking meaningless fights with your significant other. Should I be having petty arguments with my girlfriend in order to improve our relationship, Tim? I am so hurt right now. What? I was assuming you were going to say, should I be picking fights with Tim? We Um. have nothing but petty fights. (laughs) The difference is we do not make up. Oh. We have petty arguments between massive arguments. (laughs) For a couple hours every week, we managed to stop screaming at each other to record this podcast and edit it down to an hour where one of us doesn't say something that the other person begins crying when they hear. You're absolutely right. A lot of this is we should break up, but then make up. After the screaming's at an end, why don't we do it all again? That's where the fun really begins. Yeah, I don't want to be in a constant screaming match with my girlfriend. You're not really reaching your relationship's potential then. Oh, well... And that's fine. There's a noise I have to try to make now, Tim. (laughs) Do you know the noise I'm talking about yet? Is it a duck noise? No. Move past it. It was on the first song. There's no more ducks on this entire album. We'll see. If you read the lyrics to this song, it is described as an O. It is in no way her saying O. So I'm going to do my best to, to impersonate this noise. Why this would be repeated as part of the chorus is beyond me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. It's the... It's said twice every chorus. It sounds like 
Bob's Burgers, the mom on the show, she mm-hmm. loves singing. And that's essentially <laughs> what she's doing. That is true. Oh, it drove me so crazy. It is the dumbest noise I've ever heard a mouth make. <laughs> She makes it quite clear that she don't want no scrub. Yeah, but you can't just come out and say that in this day and age. No, it's not the 90s. Let me read a few lyrics, because this one ends in a way that I wasn't expecting. I'll let you touch me if you want. I see your body rise, rise. And when you come, don't get too hot. Butterfly. That's a bad nickname for a dude. I would say it's a bad nickname in general. I'm not even going to get gender specific. Track number four, Breathe On Me. These are some of the worst lyrics I've ever heard. Let me read to you from verse two. Oh, this is way beyond the physical. Too way beyond the physical. Tonight, my senses don't make sense at all. Take me in, let it out. Don't even need to touch me, baby. Just breathe on me. Couple of questions. Who wrote too way beyond the physical? Britney Spears. Okay. Uh, Question number two. Have you ever read either Fifty Shades of Grey or hilarious excerpts from Fifty Shades of Grey? The latter, yes. This is approximately of that quality. It is fan fiction, which is what that book was. His lips part like he's taking a sharp intake of breath, and he blinks for a fraction of a second. He looks lost somehow, and the earth shifts slightly on his axis, the tectonic plates sliding into a new position. Wait, that's in this song? No, no, no. That's Fifty Shades of Grey. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Too way beyond the physical, Garrett. I think that she might be a little confused on what monogamy is, or she is having (laughs) the lamest affair I've ever heard of. (laughs) She makes reference. She says, monogamy is the way to go. Just put your lips together and blow. So either she is in a monogamous blowing relationship where they just kind of (laughs) breathe on each other, or she believes that she is cheating on that curly headed fuck, Justin Timberlake. You do not talk about J Tim that way. You know what? Full disclosure. I got no problems with Justin Timberlake. I think he's a talented man. Yeah. I mean, he's made some garbage music. Oh, sure. But who hasn't? I'll tell you who hasn't Texas toast. That's right. I love the the line, monogamy is the way to go. Just put your lips together and blow. That might be my favorite line on this album. It is so goddamn ridiculous. This is also very fitting given our last episode on Simple Plan where Pierre or possibly Sebastian was talking about just wanting to be in the same room with a lady. Like that. that's all we need. These um, two should have found each other. Star cross lovers right here. Now granted, Britney Spears would be dead in a fucking underground basement right now, but <laughs> maybe Maybe not, because I don't think she would have rejected him. They could have just gone and uh, she could have just told him, breathe on me. Oh, baby, just breathe on me. We don't need to touch. Just breathe. And he would have been like, that. that's cool. That's I, all I, I've ever been looking for. Right. She could have saved him and a number of women. <laughs> Allegedly. This is yet another situation where if you reverse the roles a little bit, things instantly become very creepy. All right, Let's so imagine we're picturing for a Drew Carey. No. no. <laughs> I'm going to be picturing Drew Carey. Okay. Go on. You know what? So let's say she's got a thing for 45-year-old men when she was 21. She's in a room with Drew Carey. They have had a lovely evening out, had a couple of drinks. They head back to Brittany's apartment for a nightcap. And he leans in to make his Drew Carey move. And she goes, no, no, just breathe on me. Weird, but he's going to do that. (laughs) Yeah, he is. Okay. You want me to just like lean over and like blow on you? Yes. Okay. I guess that's what we're doing. Now, let's say same exact scenario. (laughs) I don't think we should. Britney Spears comes 90% expecting Drew Carey to come that last 10. But instead he says, breathe on me. She is calling the police. At a bare minimum, she's not doing it. You just want me to like breathe all over you or like any particular way or no, doesn't matter. Just as long as it's on me. This is monogamy to me. (laughs) Meaningful breathing relationship. Track number five, early morning. (sighs) Moby, finally, he makes an official appearance. Moby making his first real official appearance on the show. And guys, it's been months. It's been months and we have not heard from Moby. Moby, buddy, reach out. Let us know you're okay. Let us know you're no longer angry about that wine stain on your couch. Or let us know that you are. I'm okay. We don't ca- We don't even need to be friends anymore. We just need to know that he's okay. 
That's true. I will sacrifice the friendship to know that he's okay. That's how much I care about Moby. That's how much we all care about Moby. You know what? I'd breathe on Moby. Would you ask him to breathe on you, though? No, I would never ask that of Moby. Okay. Is this song written as a response to peer pressure? I think she wrote this to make Paris Hilton think she was cool. It's got a very freshman bragging kind of thing. Dude, we partied so late, I got home, the sun was coming up, but we were just getting home. But, you know, like the sun? So it was morning when we were getting home is what I'm saying. A couple of things with this. One, more spoken word. Two, yeah. Yawns are used as background music, question mark? I got a real problem with the yawns because I can't hear a yawn and not yawn. (laughs) Yeah. It is your kryptonite. Yeah, yawns. The sound of yawns will be the death of you. Just saying the word yawn is making me all yawny. I want to dig into some lyrics here. Baby, we can make plans. Where you live? Does your mama live there? We can hook up at the hotel. Is she into dudes that live with their parents? She is, yes. Well, you have to understand she's 21. I guess that's still possible then. Yeah. There is a genius annotation that explains all of this, though. I doubt that. Brittany is discussing with the guy where they can go to have sex. She finds out that his mother is living with him, so his house would be quite inconvenient. Hotels, though, are great places for wealthy and young celebrities like Brittany to hook up with somebody because in hotels, unlike with Brittany's house, there is no one else to disrupt them while they're having sex. Good news, America. Not just the wealthy or the young (laughs) can enjoy intercourse in a hotel. Believe it or not, according to Tom Bodet, you can check into a Motel 6 right now. He will leave the light on for you. Honestly, it's within anyone's means. Yes, it is. If you want to have hotel sex, you can do that today. In fact, some hotels cater exclusively to people there for having sex. They are not expensive hotels and you can rent them by the hour. You shouldn't use those hotels. Even if you are planning on using those, like there's a like a two, three hour build up period where you're just breathing on each other. And I assume there's a two to three hour <laughs> cool down period. Are you breathing on each other during the cool down? Oh, yeah. You got to. What if you get heated up again? Keeps going. Eventually, give it two, three hours of just breathing on each other. You'd be ready Jesus. to go again. But eventually you'll breathe on each other for two to three hours and then you'll be like, OK, I think we're good. <laughs> Can I go to my house? You go home to your mom. Who's living with you. You're not living with her. Her mom's been living with her since she was eight. (laughs) By track number five, I was very much done with people talking under somebody singing. It convinces me that there's someone in the room with me. I am almost always listening to this on headphones and I just end up like jerking around trying to see if somebody's sneaking up on me or watching me. Your girlfriend is quite the sneak. She is a tiny little ninja, but that's not what this is about. She doesn't whisper. She just walks up silently like an elephant. Elephants are, uh, are silent they have very soft feet look it up elephants are deadly because you don't hear them coming she could have had a cd where she just the opening track is just her spoken word again because that's what we're doing and she just says i really enjoy dancing and i feel that it is in some ways analogous to sexual intercourse which is also something that i enjoy and we could have just been done with it we don't need all of this i think the problem was twitter wasn't a thing yet Oh, yeah. If she could have just gotten on Twitter and said, y'all, I just had sex. It is great. (laughs) Track number six, Toxic. I didn't remember the gaps, the pausing of the music Mm -hmm. in the beginning. That drives me crazy. It harkens back to the days of CDs skipping. Yeah, it's just baked into my brain that when that happens, I just instantly pick up my phone. I'm like, what's going on? It's getting late. To give you up, I took a sip from my devil's cup. Now, Tim, you have drank from the devil's cup. Can you tell us what is in that cup? It's probably different for every person. For me, it was milk. (laughs) Yeah. I don't really enjoy a, a big glass of milk, so I was assuming that that was the devil. He knows what I don't particularly want to be drinking, and he tailored that to me. Otherwise, that means the devil is just going around drinking milk. So not only does he harvest your soul for eternity, he's also incredibly petty. I cannot taste of the devil's cup as another person. That's true. There is a chance that he's just drinking milk. Boy, I don't know what's more disturbing. So I assume you didn't watch the music video to this? No. Okay, I didn't either. But I think I had seen some of it at some point. Uh, It doesn't really matter. What's interesting is it got banned from MTV for being too racy to play during the daytime. It was explicitly stated by MTV due to the fact that everybody saw Janet Jackson's breast 
this is now too explicit to show during the day. As though you only have so much explicit content you can view for the year, I guess. Yeah, and you would think that, that that would make it less explicit by comparison. Would, exactly my point. But instead, they seem to think that you've got some sort of devil's cup that can be filled with milk or illicit content. And then even weirder is that, well, we can't play it during the day. But if we play it at night when the sun can't see you watching it, that's better. Yeah, are, I get it. What are we not? <laughs> I forget that you worship Ra, the sun god. Not exclusively. You worship many gods. I do worship many equally. gods. Right. It's almost exclusively Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, but get a little raw in there. Look, don't. I cannot be sure that Jesus Christ is the one true God. It might be raw, and I don't want to upset him if he is the one true God. Let us not forget about Moloch, the owl god. I'm not a Moloch fan. When yeah. did you roll off Moloch? I, it's just, it seems like one of those rich people, like, banging cults. Yeah, well, you're mostly right. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw that uh, Tom Cruise, or possibly, uh, who's the pirate? Johnny Depp? Yeah, Johnny Depp. It was, it was Tom Cruise. Okay. <laughs> Eyes wide shut. Nicole I get them Kidman. mistaken. Kubrick. In 2003, Britney Spears told MTV, It's basically about a girl addicted to a guy. I really like Toxic. This villain girl, she'll do anything to get what she wants. The word choice that she uses, first of all, I don't know how any of that relates to the song. That's basically a Robert Christgau review of this song. The only part of that sentence that made any sense is where she said that she is stuck in a relationship with someone whom she knows is not good for her. I didn't say that. Oh, then I, said, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> I don't hate the music in this song. It's the song that leans the most heavily on this sort of Middle Eastern or Indian sound. I completely get why this was a single. It was, it's her only Grammy win to date, which I was kind of surprised by. So the chorus is, with a taste of your lips, I'm on a ride. You're toxic, I'm slipping under. With a taste of a poison paradise, I'm addicted to you. Don't you know that you're toxic? And I love what you do. Genius annotation number one. The chorus itself continues to hammer the point home of the love interest being both too dangerous, uh, stating that he slash she is like a poison, adding that she is addicted to him slash her. Makes sense. Genius mm -hmm. annotation number two. This chorus tells about the struggle of being a black American in a capitalist world. Who knew this song was so woke? Good for Britney. It's not. That person's <laughs> completely wrong. I wish it were, but it isn't. Yeah. Sorry, sir or madam. Track number seven, Outrageous. This one was produced by R. Kelly. So you know, because R. Kelly, famed musician, famed producer, famed movie producer, everything this guy touches is gold. So you know this is going to be great. Yeah, that man is uh, synonymous with golden everything. Golden. Let me stop you right there. I see what you're doing. You're turning this into something weird. And uh, I don't appreciate you besmirching the good name. Those charges were dropped, sir. I don't know what you're talking about. All I'm saying is that when you hear the name R. Kelly, you think of various golden things. Golden tennis rackets, golden light fixtures. Golden faucets, golden shower heads. He's a rich man, and he should he be. He's producing. He was, accused of, being on women. He was <laughs> accused of being on women. He was accused of being on women. This is post allegations. This came out almost two years after that. That's ridiculous. It's also post marrying a fifteen year old whenever he was twenty seven. That he did happened. Take a child bride. What's crazy is they don't go to trial. They make <laughs> horrible accusations with videotape proof. Yeah, I, mean, I should say all of it's alleged, even though you, like I said, you can see the evidence it's very yeah, crystal judge clear for yourself watch the videos judge don't, for yourself no it, that is illegal <laughs> don't watch those videos don't buy things that r kelly has done the chorus is outrageous when i move my body outrageous when i'm at a party outrageous in my sexy jeans is she particularly outrageous in your mind no no okay. she is not well tim she i don't know if you know this she recently learned about sex that's true, and a rumor has it that she is the first one to do that, the sex. Well, she's a big fan. She wants to get the word out. More talk singing, of course. It, it's so bad in this one that I called her the Elvis Costello of pop music. <laughs> and don't take that the wrong way. I fucking love Elvis Costello, but that man 
talks sings under the guise of being post-punk. But she's not talk singing. For long stretches, she is talking. There's also the lyrics here, jumped over drama and I landed on my feet. That's a line that won't age well. Got to keep going, no stopping me, and if you don't like it, then la 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 la. I assume that's supposed to mimic a child putting his or her fingers in their ears and saying la 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 can't hear you, that kind of thing. Well, it is technically said as la 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 la. <laughs> it is, but I don't think that's how it's meant. <laughs> yeah, you get 45 outrageouses in this song alone. Outrageous. Outrageous. Did you get the general impression that about two thirds of the way through the song, it transitions into some sort of Michael Jackson esque song when she sings, I just want to be happy in a place where love is free. Can you take me there, somebody? And then literally goes, Whoo! Yeah. She was just shy of a shamal. And then at the end, it transitions to the Aladdin soundtrack. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's Arabian Nights all over this thing, which is fine, but it makes no sense with the rest of this song. Before we move on, I have a officially licensed by Garrett Snopple fun fact here. No. Before her injury, this was supposed to be the theme song for the movie Catwoman. Uh, That would have made sense. I disagree. Why is that? I mean, the song- You clearly never saw the movie Catwoman. Did you see the movie Catwoman? As much as I could watch. Is she outrageous? You know what? The best word I can use to describe that fucking movie is outrageous. (laughs) Fair enough. It is outrageous that somebody gave anyone money to do that. It is outrageous that somebody pretended like they were proud to be in it. That's how good of an actress she is. She won an Academy Award for her acting, and then she pretended to be Catwoman, and then she pretended that she wasn't horribly disappointed in that. No, she couldn't actually do that. She attended the Razzies that year and accepted her award for worst performance. Oh, well done. That's impressive. Track number eight, Touch of My Hand. This song is just about how she uniquely enjoys masturbation. Well, she didn't just find sex, Tim. Because when you make a pledge of chastity, it's not just with a partner. It's with yourself. That doesn't sound right. Well, that's because you're a sinner. This song is about the devil's handshake. I'll read her words. Because I just discovered imaginations taking over. Another day without a lover, the more I come to understand the touch of my hand. That's a pretty obvious analogy, but I would argue this may fit for the new theme song to our podcast. I'll read it again, because I just discovered, you know, we're always discovering new artists, Mm -hmm. imaginations taking over. Oftentimes we have to fill in the gaps where the artists themselves haven't let us into their process. Another day without a lover. Okay, that one arguably isn't going to fit great. We're both doing... We're not... No, no. We're... Tim? All right, that one doesn't fit. That one Thank doesn't you. fit. The more I come to understand, you know, we're understanding more and more every time we, we do a new episode. The touch of my hand. Now, again, that one is a little <laughs> confusing. <laughs> How You know what? It fits, though, because as I mentioned a few episodes back after the pre-episode prayer, you have been holding my hand longer and longer into the episode. Don't think I didn't notice. And you know what, Tim? How dare we? I know there's a lot to talk about here, but you often get in uh, character, we'll say. You like to prepare for the episode by dressing thematically, and it's a shame nobody ever gets to see it, because for those of you familiar with the, the Video Music Awards performance where Britney came out in a in a tuxedo suit style situation, only to reveal it was a tearaway with a nude colored sequence unitard, well, Tim has just eschewed the suit and he is adorned in diamond sequence i attempted to britney it up this week you would not allow me into our studio uh with the python that i was carrying on my shoulders and yeah i'm incredibly scared of snakes (laughs) so if if you ever meet garrett eh, bring a snake no I will stab you. This song does in fact imply that she just learned about masturbating. Yes. That could mean that she just finally gave it a whirl. She She's okay. out there being a young, confident woman, Tim. Fair enough. Dating okay. 45-year-olds. It's entirely possible she knew about it, but just finally decided to give it a whirl. But Let's yeah, talk about the opening. We should, because I really related to this. What? <laughs> You'll see. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about the music. It opens with that weird Kenny Rogers song, What Condition? Then it moves into the same violin I have heard in every single massage I have ever had. 
before and you have a lot of massages an abnormal amount of massages that doesn't sound right i have the appropriate number of massages for an active adult (laughs) with a series of upper leg injuries yes Yeah, I get a lot of upper leg injuries. I have tight quads and hammies. I'm not ashamed of that. And then finally, the music transitions into what I can only describe as the Limp Biscuit Mission Impossible theme song. (laughs) All within the first 30 seconds. I have to say, though, I really related to the opening lines of this song. If I may, I am not ashamed of the things that I dream. I find myself flirting on the verge of obscene. Into the unknown, I will be bold. I'm going places I can be out of control. Garrett, she has some sort of cowboy shame too, but she has taught me this week that I do not need to be ashamed of that or any other of my urges. So (laughs) you're going to be hearing a lot more from me and you're going to be hearing a lot more directly from my urges. So you can thank Miss Spears for that. I don't know how I could possibly hear more about your urges. You get a very filtered version. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah. Is there a tag on iTunes worse than explicit? <laughs> Good God. Okay, second of all, she has no cowboy shame. She is not talking about She's cowboys. She's ashamed of the things she dreams. Uh-huh. Cowboys. <laughs> That's what you dream. And you should be ashamed. You're going to tell me you know for sure that she's not dreaming of cowboys. She seems like the sort of person that might just be dreaming of cowboys. She is very new to her sexuality. Yeah. So I don't see how that has anything to do with I'll cowboys. Explain. She has to work through all the classics first. And you know? you've lost me. <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck are you saying? She has to work the through classics. all the classic fantasies as she explores her sexuality. And one of the very early ones for every young boy or girl is cowboys. No? Either being one or being with one. It doesn't matter. The point is cowboys, they factor in very early to your sexual discovery of yourself. Okay. I'll just say okay. <laughs> the weird thing about this song, though, I watched a Barbara Walters in interview and uh, this song was brought up this isn't an exact quote but it was something along the lines of this song is about you with like yourself uh yeah like that was all she would say about it i mean you want to talk about the devil's handshake with barbara walters yes garrett that's the (laughs) these conversations are so hard to have with you because we're coming from such different places when it comes to human sexuality (laughs) You're, you're all cowboys and Barbara Walters. Oh, God. <laughs> Track nine. The hookup. I can't believe everything your body make me wanna do. I really hate this song. Yeah. I tried to figure out what she's even talking about. I'm gonna read you some lines here, Tim. Back it up now. Mm-hmm. Bump your rump now. Mm-hmm. Grab my waist now. Mm-hmm. Grab my shoulder. Pick it up now. Take it lower to the floor now so i followed these steps because i assumed it was some sort of new dance i couldn't get up for a day i don't even know what she's talking about i assume it's dancing or sex or sex dancing sansing dance sexing this is terrible and i don't want to talk about it anymore i agree track number 10 shadow i only have one thing to say about this song This sounds like a Garrett Harvey original. If I may, I'm watching you disappear, but you, you were never here. It's only your shadow, never yourself. It's only your shadow, nobody else. It's only your shadow filling the room, arriving too late and leaving too soon and leaving too soon. That's you. Well, okay, that's very rude. Can only be another sign. I cannot keep what isn't mine. I will admit... It is reminiscent. Let me go on. <laughs> oh, God damn it. You say it so loud, but you sound far away. Maybe I had a glimpse of your soul. Or was that your shadow I saw on the wall? Garrett, this song is you. Not you now, but the, you know, the stupid. If you're trying to tell me that that song sounds like the following. <laughs> I look, I see, her eyes meet me, but a glance is all I get. I search for things that few even look for, and see what no one sees. Every step, wave, smile, and gesture, the smallest toss of her hair. The only other thing I notice is, she doesn't even know I'm there. I have a lot of problems if you're trying to tell me that what you read sounds anything like what I read. I think that's a repeat, but good God, it's perfect for this. It is a repeat for those of you keeping track at home. I haven't run out. 
I just picked the one that sounded shockingly like it. Not to mention, we got a lot of new listeners here. So uh, we want, want people to enjoy some classics. Not to mention, if you've memorized my poetry, please stop listening. <laughs> You're terrifying. So oh. your point is taken. There were some slight similarities between the author of that song and me. Yes. Yeah, you were, again, I think you can sue because your ninth or 10th grade experience, yeah. that was, what, 15 years before this album? That's it bullshit. Was not nearly that many years. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what this song was actually about, and I came up with some theories. It Excellent. could be about a relationship she's having with a ghost. Always possible. The shadow, <laughs> and the shadow is the apparition, because as we all know, you cannot physically touch a ghost. It could be a psycho situation where she's living with a corpse. I hope that's not the case. There's a third and fourth case scenario, and they get darker. <laughs> scenario three, she has learned to raise the dead. That's and not she is darker living... than living with a corpse, Garrett. You have... Well, it is if she's banging it. And I quote, your body's warm, but you are not. You give a little, not a lot. No, It work. could be love until we kiss. You're all I want, but not like this. <laughs> I'm watching you disappear, i.e. disintegrate or decompose. No, okay. No, no, no. I'm not even going to entertain this. Um, okay. Well, I got one more. All right. And I think it's arguably the most rock solid. Is there a chance that she is living with a, boy, how can I explain this? Sort of a dummy-like situation, like that time I came over to your house and didn't knock and found you with what you described as a podcast practice dummy? Oh, yeah, I do. Because, Garrett, you know me, I stutter quite a bit. So, you know, these have to be edited to some degree anyway. Some would argue very heavily. But I do, in fact, practice my my bits, my my points for hours. Obviously, the dummy does not have as good a banter as you. Mm -hmm. But still not bad. Right. Now, why did it need to be anatomically correct? I like accuracy. Same reason I put a beard on it, Garrett. Because I'm pretending... I don't think the two are related. It is. I'm pretending it's you. Okay, but I am never nude when we podcast. I mean... Not gonna, not gonna put clothes on a dummy like a weirdo? Yeah. It would be weird had I taken the clothes off, right? I think we can agree on that. It came naked in the mail. Hold on. My, no, okay, but my Did point Did you send is, them like a picture of me? Oh, no, they've got a catalog of... Of uh, me? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> of various features, and you can pick and choose between them, and I know you. My point is that uh -huh. as weird as it would be to remove the clothing, I think it's right. just as weird to put them on, because then you're, you're maneuvering pants, and what if you walk in whenever I'm struggling with the pants, and it seems like I'm taking the pants off? I'll leave it the way it came. Rock solid defense. Can't poke a hole in there. Track number 11, Brave New Girl. God damn it, this is empowering. This is empowering. This sounds like the anthem for a 90s Disney show about a girl named Chloe that had to change high schools because her parents moved from New York City to Mississippi and people don't like her there at first, but she's not going to change. And by the end of the school year, everyone's going to like her for her. That's shockingly similar to what I have written down. <laughs> and then I came to a very interesting conclusion that this song is so stupid, it's not worthy of live action. It has to be animated, oh. but the exact same plot's exactly the same. She legitimately raps in this song, and mm -hmm. it's not great. Not as bad as that time Jack White rapped. No, it's not. You mentioned how empowering this song is, right? I couldn't help but feel as though you were probably sitting at your house before we met at the Why I Hate This Album World Podcast headquarters to talk about this today, but I couldn't help but get the idea that you were sitting at your house listening to this feeling empowered, and I was trying to put my finger on why you would feel so empowered. So, Tim, I want to read a verse here, and I'm going to change, obviously you're not a girl, I'm going to change she to he and, and her to him's. I want to know if you seek any sort of inspiration from this verse to, well, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so just go ahead and listen. He's going to step outside, uncover his eyes. Who knew he could feel so alive? His M.O. changed. He don't want to behave. Isn't it good to be a brave boy tonight? It's amazing what a difference changing the gender can make. It's a very empowering song for a female. From mm -hmm. the male perspective, that's a song sung about and by a serial killer. Oh, I could see how you might think that. Yeah, I do think that. Okay, I thought it might inspire something else, but you no. know what? I, I could see how you go down that road. 
There is also a made-for-TV movie with this same name. It is not based on this song. However, it is adapted from the quote-unquote novel A Mother's Gift, which was the second book Brittany and her mom wrote together. They wrote it what? in 2001. No word yet on how it compares to Tobin's Keith's movie. Brad was supposed to watch them, but Brad didn't get back to me in time, so I, I don't know. Should have put Kevin on it. Track number 12, Every Time. This is the song that's in response to uh, J. Tim's Cry Me a River, right? She is haunted in her dreams by Justin Timberlake. Many people don't know this, but much like Freddy Krueger, Justin Timberlake controls the dream world. He can move seamlessly from the real world into the dream world and from person to person's dream. And if Justin Timberlake kills you in your dreams, you die in real life. Is that true? Well, I can't say for certain. Obviously, he hasn't done it to me. Try not to ask stupid questions. Okay. She considers Justin to be her wings, and she says, Every time I fly, I fall. Without my wings, I feel so small. I guess I need you, baby. So if Justin Timberlake is her wings, you, Tim, are like my cement shoes. That is rude. Is it in any way inaccurate? I think so. I, I do nothing but lift you up and encourage you. Because you have a <laughs> I, insatiable I, I, need to raise me above your head whenever you see me does not mean you are lifting me up. But Garrett, let me ask you this. How often mm -hmm. am I clutching around your feet versus how often do I jump on your back and flap my arms as if they are your wings? Or you definitely do the latter in a ratio of 12 to 1. Right. I'm your wings. But you're never going to get me off the ground like that. You're I'm my your gargoyle. metaphorical wings. No, you are my literal gargoyle. You're <laughs> perched atop me like a demon with your arms spread like wings. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Can we be done? Oh, yeah. The only thing we need to mention here, there is on the original version a 13th track, Me Against the Music, Rishi Rich's Desi Kulcha remix that we don't Jesus, give a you shit. You can't fucking read. <laughs> you say it then. You know what? No, no, no. I don't give a shit about this song. I don't give a shit about how to pronounce that person or band or production team's name. <laughs> it's like the first song, but worse somehow. Agreed. This was a number one album on the US Billboard 200. It was number one in Greece and it was number one in France. Number two in Germany and Canada. Number eight, Swedish Sverigetopplisten and Garrett, your favorite, number nine on the Dutch mega charts. Now, when we're off the air, whenever you're reminding me to look up the Dutch sales figures, you always ask, what do the Dutch like? What does it take to get to number one in Holland or Denmark or whatever? This week, I finally learned Dutch well enough to read some Netherlandese websites about the Dutch mega charts. This was beaten by, in order, Franz Bauer's N Ons Geluk, De Poema's Best of, Dido's Life for Rent, Red Hot Chili Peppers' Greatest Hits, K3's Ovalele, Robbie Williams' Live Ilse de Lang's Here I Am, and The Beatles' Let It Be Naked. So now we know what the Dutch actually like. I just want to be clear. I've never once asked you what the Dutch like or to look up the Dutch mega charts. In fact, I've, I've asked you in both oral and written forms to please stop it. I do have an interest in Sverigetopliskin, but <laughs> nobody cares about the Dutch. Back to the U.S. This was the eighth best-selling album of 2004. It sold three to four million copies in the U.S., depending on which source you use. Overall, she has sold over a hundred million albums in total. Holy shit. Puts her pretty high in the all-time sales list right between Rod Stewart and Linkin Park. It's what a good, weird list. Good company to be in. So it made all the money. What do yeah. people think of it? We do not have a Robert Christgau review. I was actually very surprised. I think this might be the only Britney Spears album not to get a review by him. On Amazon, though, there are 1,470 reviews, which I That's think... That's a new record. I think so. 4.0 out of 5 stars average. So let me read a few reviews here. The first is simply by a customer from 2004, and it's titled OMG. This is all in caps. I'm not going to scream it, but whenever the person was typing this, they were screaming it at their screen. OMG, I just heard breaking news. 
Brittany's having a baby with her boyfriend, Kevin, and now she's quitting her career to be a full-time housewife. That's just heartbreaking. The music world wouldn't be the same without Brittany, and she doesn't need to quit her day job. If she does, who's going to be the queen of pop? She's going to marry him before the baby is due, but I don't think she really loves him. She needs to hire a babysitter or get an abortion, but she shouldn't quit her music career. (laughs) Oh my God. That's not about this album at all. (laughs) When expecting a child, your two options are not get a babysitter or an abortion. That's true, but those are two options. Technically, those are two options that you have. But you have other options. I think it's strange. This is what, episode 33? Something like that. I think it's strange this is the first album that's had a review suggesting somebody get an abortion. I'm just going to say it. I am surprised we made it this long. Next review by Kingdom of Life called It's a Britney Spears Album. Four out of five. I like it. I won't lie, though. I bought the album because she was super hot on Toxic Video and for the album booklet. Not a perv though, lol. On account the album is 12 songs, it's a four to five star album. Being a straight guy, you can imagine the ridicule I suffer from my friends, lol. But I think the album is not as bad as I thought it would be. The bonus remix with Madonna should have been the original song because I hate the original song, lol sorry. If you're afraid to buy it, buy a used album. Thanks Britney for the good album, five out of five stars. That could have used at least three more lol. <laughs> this is called Aural Progress. It's from 2005 by Empowering Feminist. I think this oh. might be Lena. This album is the grandest album of all the time. From the urban beats of I Got That Boom Boom to the subtle eroticism of Touch My Hand, every song is carefully crafted and extremely hot. A universally praised masterpiece for the ages. Wow. Every bit of that is wrong. Great reviews. That brings us almost to the end. Let's ask the first of a few questions. Who is this for? Britney Pe- Spears fans. Yeah, that's who it's absolutely. for. Absolutely. And that one really straight guy who made it a point to tell us how straight he was. He's he's not a perv though. LOL. No, not a perv at all. LOL. I think it's for people that are doing group class workouts at the gym. This is definitely for Zumba. Or even like a soul cycle class. Whenever I was looking at Amazon ratings, I noticed that a lot of her albums are available on vinyl. Who is that for? DJs. I don't think People DJs are... use, I don't think they do that anymore. Oh, then then I don't know. Final thoughts. What haven't we said about this album? I don't care. I don't think it was worth our time. I don't think it was worth anyone's time. It's very competently made. This is a, it's a dance album, as you said. It sounds fine, if way overproduced. And she's not very good at singing. Do you hate this? No, I don't think I do. It's not for me. It never hit the weird self-seriousness that drives me over the edge with some of our previous albums. It stayed largely on the surface. It's an inoffensive album. It's Britney Spears talk whispering for 12 or 13 tracks. Sounds like something you'd hate. (laughs) Yeah, it's not great. It's really not good. I don't ever want to hear it again. If Madonna were on another song, I'd hate it. She is technically on another song. Yeah, I don't think I do. If I had to listen to it for a couple more days, I would hate it. But there's way worse out there. What about you? Do you hate it? I think I I think I hate it. It's definitely not as bad as a lot of the albums that we've done. But I do. Mm-hmm. I recognize its right to exist. And I think that's maybe the nicest thing I can say about it. I think I hate it. Feel free to hate it. Yeah, you I do. Right to hate it. I think. I'm going to say I don't hate it. A rare split. You failed to get me there. A little housekeeping as always. Many reviews have been written. They are all very funny, and we promise we're going to read them on the episodes just coming up real soon. Um, So if you could rate, review, subscribe, it really does help us out. We really appreciate it. Go to hatepod.com if you want to reach out to us. Hit the contact button. Or if you're already in your email browser, just go ahead and... If you're in your email browser, do (laughs) do you know how computers work? No. No idea. If you're already in your email, just type in heypodmail at gmail.com. Send us a little note. It'd be great. On Instagram, it's HatePod. On Twitter, it's Album Hate Pod. This has been Why I Hate This Album. I am one of your hosts, Garrett Harvey. I'm the other, Tim Richardson. The riffs are too repetitive. The lyrics make no sense. All the songs are B-sides and the cover art's a mess. There's so much here to tear apart. Listen to it for a week. Now that we pass past. 
Why I Hate This Album Podcast with Tim and Garrett.